Hello, boys and ghouls. Welcome to a special episode of Dads from the Crypt. Today, we'll be going behind the scenes of the classic Crypt episode, You Murderer. And to help us do that, we have producers, Gil, producers and writers on the episode, Gil and Alan. Welcome. Hola. How you doing? Good, mm. good. All right. So let's dive into this. So you're heading into season six. At what point do you, uh, uh, does Robert, does Robert come and say he wants to do an episode? Do you come to him to say, do you want to do an episode? How did that come about? Well, every, I'll start Alec, if you don't mind. So every year we would try to get some echoes to do an episode because we could always get HBO to add that on to the order. So if they ordered 12, we would go to them close to the end of the season and go, listen, uh, Zemeckis wants to do one, uh, but we got to add one on. And they would say, okay, do it. So that was the, that was our modus. Um, so we would go to Bob and, you know, and he would always say, well, I don't want to do anything that I've done before. It's got to be different. And so one day he invited us over and, and to his office and we were sitting there talking and um, uh, we were chatting about, uh, you know, actors and who did you like and was growing up and, and we, you know, he started talking about, well, uh, talking about actors that we liked and, one of the actors was Humphrey Bogart that we all liked. And he, and he started saying how we should do a, ta that's what I want to do. He said, I want to do a Tales from the Crypt starring Humphrey Bogart. And we both sort of giggled and said, yeah, that would be really good. He goes, no, I'm serious. I really want to do that. And we sort of looked at each other kind of like, uh, well, how do we, you want us to get our shovels and dig them up? And he said, no, we'll get clips from Columbia and from Sony or wherever we have to get them from. And we'll write it. And but the, the other part of the, the other part of the, of the challenge was he wanted to do a completely subjective camera show, but from the point of view of a dead guy. And mm -hmm. the dead guy was gonna be played by Humphrey Bogart. So it was kind of the story of, as the episode is, of how he gets to be a dead guy. And had um, Forrest Gump came out at this point? I think so. Because that was that. July of twenty nineteen of ninety four. I think this was before that. Okay, so you hadn't seen the way he incorporated it into that movie as like a proof of almost the he made the movie as a proof of concept for a Tales from the Crypt episode, right? You know, he was working on something. He he as as he did he he used us to fulfill certain things that he couldn't get anywhere else, or sometimes just to test out ideas. Mm hmm. Okay, so he's got this big grand idea of incorporating old footage, and you hadn't seen Forrest Gump yet, so it hadn't really been done, at least not to that kind of extent. And you're like, "How are we going to do this?" Um, and then, did you meet with ILM? Because I know I, I'm assuming they worked on some of that as well to see, like, how how do we do this from a practical no, it perspective? Wasn't, no, 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 it wasn't ILM. It was Sony. It oh, was... okay. I guess I thought ILM did the digital effects. I don't. Hmm. I want to say Sony because we were dealing with Sony a lot, mm -hmm. uh, with um, Debbie Denice and can't think of the name of the special effects. Because mm -hmm. there have been a couple special effects, especially in this season, um, but they're very sparingly, very quick. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking of like in Fitting Punishment, where the guy gets his nose cut off. Right. You get that great quick shot about about that. Um, wait, wait, you thought that was special effect? We we actually cut the <laughs> there you go. Yeah, this is tales from the crypt. Come on. Um. Okay. So you go about planning this, and then so do you just start watching Bogart movies and just like marking down the, the timestamps that you want to use? Yeah, you know, Bob had some research. I, I, you know, as Bob usually did things, he had an idea in his head when when he approached us and. And uh, it wasn't too long before we those clips turned up. We didn't have to spend a whole lot of time looking for the clips. They seemed to appear just when they needed to. So I, I, I think he had, he, had, he had people working on it in advance because this would have taken forever, mm -hmm. realistically, to find exactly what we needed. So I, we, we had a, a bunch of, of clips that, that worked in the context of the story that we were kind of stitching together with the bits and pieces of, of, of how Bob wanted to tell the story. So it, it really was creatively 
of course it was a challenge. It mm-hmm. was in, in a lot of ways the quintessential Zemeckis challenge. You know, here's here's an impossible idea. How are we going to do this, guys? But you know, to to our advantage, though, we knew that those clips had to be part of a reflective surface mm-hmm. for the most part, because otherwise, how to use the clips? You can't. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Clip. Right. So, so then it so, becomes about the blocking of you can get you need to get the right angle to match with the clip and to make right. it. So right. it made so then, sense and fit in. And that was sort of part of the writing too. I mean, we mm-hmm. had to consider that in, in structuring, okay, what's the action and how do we accomplish that action? And where's Humphrey Bogart and how is he doing that? And in what reflective surface are we seeing that? It was half script, half script, half puzzle. Mm-hmm. It was a bit like a Rubik's cube before mm-hmm. Rubik's cubes. Um, and then tell me about the casting, because again, this is an, a very, very good cast. And again, you've got an even another level of meta having Ingrid Bergman's daughter um, in that role, dressed up pretty much the same as she is in Casablanca. Uh, I think she was inspired by the fact that uh, that Bogart was one of the act was one of the characters, and so she got it into her head and, and wanted to play her character exactly like like her mom, like like Ilsa in Casablanca. Mm-hmm. I think I think all the actors. I mean, I think they they really did it for maybe three reasons. Tales from the Crypt was pretty iconic. Bob Zemeckis is even more iconic. And look at what we're doing and how we're going to do it. And even they were sort of puzzled on the first day of yeah. well, what exactly are we doing? And we're walking <laughs> here, and where where are we seeing and how? So it was kind of you know we no one ever got rehearsal time on tales from the crypt you, every director got five days of prep and five days to shoot and there there was no time in that prep to rehearse anything but for this episode uh we gave bob two days of rehearsal time but the rehearsal time wasn't for the actors it was for the crew right and on the very first day of of rehearsal uh bob invited the entire crew even the craft services the craft service people joined in on the meeting. Everyone was part of this meeting on on set, and this was our a four wall set because being subjective camera, it had to be able to go anywhere and everywhere at any particular moment. And so, what we had to figure out as Bob kind of looked at everyone and said, "All right, guys, I think the shot's going to start like down here on the floor, and then." Uh, and then you looked at the scoops the supervisor. Well, what happens next? She said, okay, then this and this. Okay, so we got to go over here and we got to go over there and we got to go over here and over there. And then I think the shot has finished. Oh, all the way back over here. And he looked at the entire crew and he said, what do you always said? How are we going to do this, guys? <laughs> and he flew, he threw the question really onto the table and anyone could answer. There was immediate ownership by the entire crew of the puzzle and and unique to bob is there were no wrong answers there were no stupid answers every answer was valid as right. far as he was concerned and that's what made him such a great and makes him such a great collaborator because you could say anything and don't you don't have to think about it 10 times ago is this going to sound silly is this going to sound stupid is he going to think less of me he doesn't care about any of that he'll filter through the ideas he'll select what's good and what's bad and use them. And he doesn't care where they come from. Remarkable that way. It really gets it. it this is how the sum is always greater than the parts. Mm-hmm. He really and truly solicits greatness from everyone who he works with. I think one of the most underrated actors, uh, probably of the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, is John Lithgow. Um, I want to hear about I want to hear about his process and just how he dives into things. From one of you, <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't speak to his process because we never talked about it. Alas, mm-hmm. I, I wasn't clever enough, or, or, uh, yeah, aware enough of of circumstances. But he was a lovely, lovely person on set. What a, what a, a nice person to hang with. I, I, I don't remember what stories he told me, but I remember he had great stories. And he's very smart. <clears throat> he's really very smart, and and. He really absorbs. I mean, if you watch him and Bob work together, uh, there was this great simpatico and collaboration that comes when you work with a great actor and a great director. Mm-hmm. Um, and then was Robert Sachi on 
Was he there or did he just like dubbing his lines after the fact? What was his involvement? Alas. <laughs> I think we dubbed him in later. Yeah, we 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 did. We we oh we tried so hard. <laughs> we tried so hard to get something better out of him. Oh my god, that that was painful. Mm. But so it was it Rick Boda's hands that we saw most of the time. Was it was he the physicality of of the character? I don't recall actually. Do, do you remember Gil? No, I don't. I I wish. Well, when when you talk to Rick, you'll you'll ask him. Will you? Yes, well, so we'll definitely try to get a hold of Rick. Of but, um, yeah, I mean, you guys did a fantastic interview with him and look, gleaned a lot of information from there. Uh, so I, I also suggest people go listen to that as well. Um, so again are you're setting up like was there okay was there any question about doing it black and white to go full homage i think we had one conversation with bob where he brought it up mm -hmm. as he often would do knowing already the answer to the question by saying hey what do you guys think if we did it in black and white or we could shoot it in color but we'll just take the color out what, what do you guys think mm -hmm. and we all and i think we both said yeah, how does that change the lighting? How does that change the amount of time needing needed to shoot? And he said, no, that's not going to change. <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. That's not the, what the question was. The question was, how would you feel if it were in black and white? Yeah. And we both thought, wow, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. You know, it's what, what when, when your boss asks you <laughs> that kind of question, well, you know, it's, what's he really asking you? Right. Um, so you're kind of, so for those reflective services that you're adding to, do you just put like a, did you put like a green, like, uh, paper or like a green cloth over a, a surface? Green. How did you technically do like, that? Gr like green screen? Yes. So oh, green screen. Oh, as if. I think, I think actually in those days it was blue. <laughs> or blue. Oh man. No, it, it, no, no such thing, man. Everything was practical. So I guess more did you like mark out so the so when you did the camera movie you had an idea of where people were the where the camera's supposed to focus or where people supposed to focus for different shots? Yes. This this is where Bob got to play. Mm-hmm. Because this is this is really the stuff that 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 I think he it fascinates him. It's the you're into such an abstract kind of thinking. What you have to have in your head. And then to be able to articulate that so that somebody else understands it enough to begin to, to get him to the point where he goes, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That's, that's almost the, the greater part of Bob's skill set. Hmm. And not just to have these, to think these remarkable, have these visions of what a movie shot could look like. And also what he'll do, what he'll do is he'll start a shot and he has in his head, you know, sort of a general idea of what the layout is and what the geography is. Mm -hmm. But he'll take that shot and extend it as far as he can before cutting, because he'll just see things along the way. And he'll go, oh, I can get another another few feet out of this scene and it'll give me more to to, to, to work with in, when, in the editing. Mm -hmm. And so in this in this situation, the editing was even more difficult because we had to hide the cuts in in some kind of black or background. So we had to you know end shots and begin shots in black or in, in something mm. that enabled us to cut because it really is supposed to feel like it's one continuous shot right which you know is which this is way before you know that was even like a thing that was done i mean now a lot most major action movies emulate the one shot and you can always kind of tell where they kind of fake oh. it but they were there's usually a camera twist and right. that's usually where they hide something or that someone goes through like a yeah. hallway. If everyone's, you know, it's all, everyone is emulating Hitchcock's rope. Right. That's, yeah. I mean, cause it's all like tracing back, you know, yeah, yeah. further that, that, and further and further. But you know, Hey, Bob, like, like, every, like every great filmmaker, you, yeah, you emulate the masters. Hey, uh, the mm -hmm. episode yellow was, mm -hmm. was Kubrick's uh, paths of glory. Right. They say, yes, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Why not? Uh, well, speaking of Hitchcock, um, so we have that fantastic opening um, with the uh, with the Forrest Gump uh, homage, and um, I, you know it's funny because again in Forrest Gump he got to do this 
fancy cgi feather this big crane shot going in and you guys was it like a feather like on a wire or <laughs> chicken uh string uh i did did you direct that that crypt keeper segment gil mm, I, don't, I don't recall i honest to god mm -hmm. but i'm assuming you guys wrote it and obviously forrest gump was a huge deal at the time and this was just a few weeks it came out a few weeks before the oscars yeah. It, this was, you know, it, the Crypt Keeper segments could be so much, it, it could be torture to write, but they could be incredible fun to write. And this one was so much fun to write. Mm -hmm. did, uh, did Bob encourage you to go that in direction or did you surprise him with it? I don't I, think he encouraged us to go in any direction with the wraparounds. He, he really liked what we were doing with the wraparounds. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think we ever... I don't remember asking him about any time. It, about it seems the such, such a natural pairing. Uh, I, oh, yeah. I, I don't think when he heard the idea, I, I don't think he said no. Okay. Or I'm curious. Like, if, if, I'm sorry. I'm curious what Tom Cruise would have, would have thought, you know, laying in bed one night watching Tills in the Crib. I'm like, oh, that's my performance now. <laughs> he took he took my performance. My and wife. then again, you have, you have him turn and then talk to a Alfred Hitchcock uh, character. Now, for that, was that a guy sitting there and then they like screen screened his head out or was the whole shot um, footage? Boy, I, I don't remember how how we did it. I I I want uh, to I want to I want to say I think it's a head replacement. This is okay. this Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of times how they have like a guy sit there and they wear like a I'm sure now they just have like wear a green face mask and you just pop the head on top of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, it's such an obvious, but were there other people you were considering to be sitting there, or is it just like it was always going to be Hitchcock? I think, well, if you look at who are the other iconic uh, anthology hosts, there aren't there aren't that many that that stand that really are in people's minds. Mm -hmm. There's Serling, but hmm, right, okay, uh, it's Hitchcock, right. He he seemed the better the better joke, hmm. um, especially in the, in the end with the uh, the pecking order is revealed. Um, so when you use that footage, did you have to get permission from a family or an estate for Bo Boger or Hitchcock? Well, I think we I think the uh, with Bogart, I think we got that from various studios, mainly Paramount and Sony, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we had to get permission and, and they, you know, gave us, they, they actually supplied the clips. Um, mm -hmm. Hitchcock, I don't remember getting any clearance from, from him, nor did we ever he, feel we needed it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, this is so forward thinking and the thing that's becoming now, like, this could be really a reality of people using old clips and creating new performances um in in kind of a terrifying way where that that yeah. there felt innovative and now it's like oh wait this could be a real dangerous precedent yeah um do you have any thoughts on the use of um well it sure is intoxicating you know when when i the stuff in my head that you think when i think of what i could get groucho marks to do <laughs> that's oh, now now wait a second that's that's don't, that's, don't, that's don't kind of intoxicating about joe <laughs> Hooray for Captain Spaulding! Yes, yes, yes. That's just my hero. Don't don't stop messing with that crowd, Joe. <laughs> well, that's well, that's the question. Is you yeah. know, if if you're if you're re remixing old uh, performances, is it really his performance, or is it like a marionette kind of situation? Is it is it his performance, or is it on the is what it is real or original? is it Memorex? Yeah, uh, that will be the the question for. Our new question for the ages: uh, Is it is or is it isn't? Mm -hmm. Um, going back to the episode for a second, though, what what I really appreciate because I watched it a few times when we did our review, and um, it's a it's obviously so this one got this one get this one got got a good review. Yes, we we gave it very good reviews, right? <laughs> especially especially knowing that this is kind of the pinnacle. Almost, it really should have been the send off in some ways. I would I think a lot of people would would agree. Yeah, for the yeah. series. But that's <laughs> what, a whole other. What's your point, Jason? <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. Um, 
think Alan, well, we should have asked that question before we started the interview. There we go. <laughs> You're too late now. Um, what I really like is obviously it's a very imaginative, forward thinking. It's got a lot of things visually happening um, that hasn't really been done before, at least not in this capacity. But what I love is in the very end, you find that essence of a crypt episode. Um, the irony, the um, the little, the little, the morbid twist to end on. So, like, you know, I was watching it with my wife. Uh, I got her to watch it, which I only get to do every once in a while. And she was very really confused about some some of the what kind of what was happening. It was just really over. I wouldn't say over her head, but it was just it was a lot happening in a short period of time. But then when the, the car runs into the um, John Lithgow and uh, Isabella in the dish, she's like, "Oh, okay, that's funny." <laughs> so I like that you had this like really high concept, really technically marvelous. Like how do, how are they doing this? But you end on just the perfect little morbid joke. Well, I don't know your wife, but clearly she has very good taste and she understands <laughs> us very well, perhaps better than you. <laughs> Pro- very likely. <laughs> now don't tell me she's a psychologist or a psychiatrist. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what she does off, off, off the record. But um. But I just wanted to say that I, uh, this wasn't really a question. It was more just commending you on, you know, the, the monumental task of writing was a very complicated episode, but in the end, f- still keeping the essence of Tales from the Crypt in it. Always. always. We always we always went for that. If if you're going to do a Zemeckis episode, you got to do it start to finish. And mm-hmm. if you do a Tales from the Crypt episode, it's got to be a Tales from the Crypt episode. Yeah, because sometimes they lose themselves in what they're trying to do. Yeah. And they kind of get away from that, but you know, this one again, the irony of that situation just hits. Yeah, and then, and then again, you end with the with a perfect Hitchcock joke. So, um, hats off to you guys on that. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you me. so much. And uh, and 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 then comes the next season. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, is there any other stories or memories you want to share about this episode before we wrap up? I have one incredibly strong memory. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we talked about this on on our podcast. Uh, When uh, Isabella Rossellini came in for her wardrobe fitting. And she, we had everything ready for her to go so that she would look like Ingrid Bergman. And watching Isabella float in to the area where, where we could all, you know, see what she looked like looking like her mother and looking at catching sight of herself in the mirror and the laugh, the laugh that came out of Isabella Rossellini when she caught sight of herself looking like her mom mm-hmm. is a sound I, 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 I honestly can't describe, but it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, that's, that, that's, that's my memory. Yeah. You know, this is just me being a little ignorant, but was her mother still alive at the time or she passed? Okay. Gone. Oh, she, had, she had passed. Okay. But it, it really was one of those moments, you know, Tales from the Crypt, the whole experience was lightning in a bottle. Mm-hmm. Every last bit about it. And you would find yourself at moments just like that, where you're you're thinking, I'm watching Isabella Rossellini laugh with delight because she's trying to make herself look like her mom in Casablanca. And I'm standing here in the room watching it. Yeah, I mean, cosplaying as her mom with yeah, you know, yeah, footage yeah, this, of Humphrey Bogart, like you can't make that up. That's transcendent. That's that's, and you're getting to experience that you know, a couple of times a season. You know, it was the same way with, with when Donald O'Connor did the show. You know, you find yourself sitting with the guy who did make him laugh, and he's telling you stories about that day when he shot that those days you know the couple of days it took to shoot that i i don't know that's that makes it worth the price of admission times a thousand well i mean again for me talking to you guys about this stuff that that that's my uh those are my moments the, the... You know, I, I had the same recollection I, was, I remember sitting on the set with donald o'connor right near the camera and they were setting up to doing some changes in the lighting and talking about singing in the rain. And yeah, I, 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 yeah. Do you, I remember saying, I, I don't know if you're going to want to talk about this or not, but 
I hope you don't mind me asking. I, I, I just want to ask you about singing in the rain, if that's okay. He loved it. He, he was just waiting for someone to ask him. And we had this great conversation about how long it took to do that scene, about how that couch fell over and how that they made it fall over and how they jumped over it. I mean, it was just like he was almost reliving acting out that scene in front of us as we spoke about it. And, and we were only interrupted when they said, okay, camera's ready. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Take hey, more time. <laughs> screw making this goddamn TV show. We're hearing a great story. Right. It's more important. You know, and and, and it, it's when 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 they're when you're talking nuts and bolts about you know these great movies as you're sitting there on a set, it I don't know, it makes you feel so connected to them. Yes. You're you're part of this great storytelling continuum. It it's it just takes your breath away. It's a, that's how I feel about it. But we you know what always impressed me about it was it was always sort of the same with everybody in terms of, you know, it was difficult. They were they were fighting the clock. Oh, they were yeah. fighting money. They were fighting the light if it was outside. All the things that we were doing. And when we talked to them, we're thinking, oh, no, that's a classic. They they probably, you know, had energy and time and money. No, they had the same problems. So yeah. it was kind of uh, rewarding to hear those kinds of stories. Yeah, and 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 fraught productions are fraught, and you don't necessarily you don't know that you're making the right choices or the wrong choices at the time. You you hope you're making the right choices. You you honestly don't know that that you're making a fiasco. I mean, we knew Bordello of Love wasn't going to be very good, but we, we didn't know it was going to be such a no, and it's not it's an okay movie it, it is it's there's nothing wrong with that movie it's a it's as good a piece of of work as it can be i mean we we can edit this part out if we decide it's not relevant but we're actually I, i'm sure you're aware that there was a third movie that was slapped on with the tales title uh, ritual and I, we're I, we're reviewing it tonight um are you really I'm like, and, how, how yeah, is I it feel like, what is I feel, it I feel like well because I feel like we're obligated because it has the title tells pretty telescope presents, and I would watch Bordello any day of the week over this movie. Oh boy! It is oh man, really oh. not good. What what a way to and, and they did that to to, to the franchise. They 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 sold it. They that. just sold. They sold the yeah. title. By, well, by it's, they, it, they, I, I I don't even remember anything about Ritual. So they they I believe they they basically sold the title for some money. And yeah, I'm I'm almost certain. Well, it's weird because it's based off an RKO movie. Mm -hmm. Um and they like so there's an RK, RKO title card on it. And then during the credits it says like Telsnercrip Holdings and it lists these, all the executive producers. And on the version I watched, I guess was the international version which doesn't even have the Crypt Keeper segment on it. I think they only added that in for the American. It is the worst Crypt Keeper segment I've ever seen. It is horrible. Uh, I, had nothing, I had nothing to do with it, I promise you. Yeah, no, I, I, know, you, oh I, know, I, I know you guys did it, but I mean, the only good thing is they have a good cast, but that doesn't make a good movie at all. It's no. god-awful. No. Like, even Tim Curry is in it for, like, beyond, I, I don't know why or how, but I'm sure he had his reason. Maybe because it may, and they might have filmed in Jamaica, but maybe they just wanted to get out. But it's bad, real bad. Yeah, well, so not ours, not ours. <laughs> no, so you can feel you can rest assured that you do not have the worst of the uh, Tales of the Crypt movies. That's, that's so reassuring. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> All right, well, I think that wraps things up. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, everyone, check out their podcast called. The how not, not to make to a make movie a podcast. Movie. Excellent. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Catch you later. <laughs> Follow Dads from the Crypt on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or I will follow you to the grave. <laughs> no, seriously, you really should watch. But be careful what you ask for. You may get it. <laughs>